what we're going to do now is we're going to just go through some really basic stuff in terms of how you go out and set up your property business. As I said this morning, we're now taking you out of amateur hobby league and we're putting you into professional renovator uh, mode. You are going to be going out now and you're going to be creating a small business. So there's some things that you need to make yourself look like you are a professional in this business. So um, first thing is, is, is let's, let's address the time factor. If I said to you, you can achieve your financial goals, how much time would you actually dedicate to this business? All the time, absolutely. So you need to start working out where you're actually spending your time. I've actually developed a little template and we're not going to go through this today, but I want you to do this as one of the first steps in the process. I want you to start mapping out where you're actually spending your time at the moment, okay? Because what you need to start doing, particularly with all those people who are working full-time jobs, you need to start working out where you can cut back and start dedicating time to your business. We all sleep 40 hours a week, whatever it may be. Most of you are working 40 hours in a job. So use this little template to go through and start working out where you can claw, um, claw back half an hour here, there, whatever it may be. Even if you can claw or just, just dedicate one hour a day to your new property business. That's seven hours a week. That is one day full time just by doing one hour. So instead of coming home from work, and I know it's very tempting, particularly with the winter months, just to go home and plonk yourself on the lounge and turn on Foxtel. Um, the reality is I, I never watch TV. I absolutely love TV, but I never watch it because I'm always doing other stuff that's adding more, adding more to my life. So I said to you this morning, sometimes you're going to have to make some sacrifices, so stop watching television because the reality is that could have been one hour spent on your property business, something that's going to make you money, not lose you money, so to speak. So if you can go through and just identify that, that would be absolutely great. Okay, let's just try and focus. Before you set up a new business, let's try and focus on how we can actually get you into your business. Now, there are a couple of ways. Most of you, who's working full-time jobs? Okay. Who wants to get out of their full-time job? Most of you, fantastic. So there are some ways that, the reality is, look, you're all gonna need cash flow. Cash flow may be tight for most of you. So how can you start to transition yourself out of your full-time job? There is some ways. First of all, how about, can, do you have the option of taking annual leave? The reality is for a cosmetic renovation, you're gonna need six weeks or less. So if you can take four weeks annual leave, six weeks leave, time it so that the day you start construction is, your, is day one of annual leaves. Because you can literally knock over four weeks some of you might have three months leave up your sleeve. You might be able to take four weeks, six weeks annual leave and get you through 90% of the renovation and then you've got the security of your jobs to go back to. So take annual leave. Some of you have got long service leave up your sleeve. So can you take three months off with long sleeve that's owing to you and do your renovation from start to finish? Can you work four days instead of five days? So do you have the option? Obviously, a lot of you just can't throw in your job willy-nilly, but could you live without just cutting back one, losing one day's of salary instead of your whole week's salary. So can you work four days instead of five? Can you do a 38 hour week over four longer days? So can you, instead of starting, instead of doing nine till five, can you start from eight till six and basically do four days, still do your 40 hours a week, but over four days. What it's doing is actually giving you one day to concentrate on your property business, phoning the agents, doing all those sorts of things that you need to be doing. Can you start earlier, leave earlier? If your boss says, no, look, absolutely, I need you five days in the week in the office, instead of starting at nine, can you start at seven and finish in th at three? Because the reality is, even if you can squeeze in two hours at the end of the day, at business hours, three to five, it gives you two hours to phone the agents and be talking business property stuff during core business hours. Okay, can you negotiate a day off instead of a pay rise? So most of you would probably get a pay rise every year, I presume. And so can you say, look, instead of, a, instead of you giving me $5,000 increase this year, is it possible that I could take every Monday off? Or is it possible that I could have one day off every fortnight instead of a pay rise? Some of my staff do this at the moment. They say to me, um, some of my, Julie and Marianne are both um, looking for, well, Marianne's, uh, Julie's just bought a, an unrenovated property and Marianne's looking for a property so she's out doing her due diligence now on a Friday so they actually rotate every second Friday they take off and I said that's fine they do longer hours now over four days and basically or over lot they do basically longer hours over the two week and they take every second Friday off so if you don't ask you won't receive will you so if you ask the question you're more likely to get this um, can you take time off without pay particularly um, particularly if, if we've got the people in the audience who are working government departments you might be able to get this where you 
you just basically take your first six weeks off, no pay if you can afford to take six weeks off, and then basically do your renovation and you've got your job to go back to. Um, can your job share with somebody else? So is it a job that you can basically do where you're on three days and somebody else does the other two so there's no disruption to your employer? Can you think of any other ways? Your partner stay at home? Yeah, so basically, like if you're a husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend, whatever it may be, maybe one of you can afford to throw in your job and the other one continues working. So there's so many ways that you can transition yourself. You've got to just start thinking about them because obviously the sooner you can transition out of your full-time jobs, the better it's going to be for you and that's when you're going to really notice leaps and bounds. When you're also doing it full-time, everybody will treat you, again, entirely different by you working a full-time job somewhere else, they can see that you're now a dedicated person, property professional, who is making this their full-time business. So the sooner the better. All right. Um, so to be taken seriously in this game, you do need to take yourself out of that amateur hobbyist game, and we're now going to make you into a professional renovator. Now, the first thing you need to do, one of the first steps of the process, is that you have to do a business plan. Now, I know you're probably thinking, oh, business plan, plan that sounds boring. But let me tell you, if you don't have a business plan of what you want to achieve, it's like walking down a path with no direction. You don't know what you're aiming for. I've included a business plan template on your disk, so the structure is already there. And what I want you to do is I want you to go away and start thinking, putting some short-term goals, short-term goals within the next three months, the next six months, the next year, and probably just out to two years, okay? And they don't need to be hard goals. Your short-term goals might be to have, you know, step three completed by the end of three months, okay? So you become an expert in the suburb and the property due diligence. Your six-month goal might be to have your first cosmetic renovation underway, at least started. You know, at the end of year one might be to have one cosmetic reno under your belt or one structure, whatever it may be. Now, this business plan is particularly important for the couples. Who are the couples in the audience, husband and wife? A lot. Fantastic. So as couples, you need to basically work out who's going to do what and what you both because there's no point basically you going off on one direction and, and you going off on a totally different mindset because that's where you're going to have start to have issues in your relationship so may I say make a fun weekend of this um, it, it is a bit of a drag to be honest but it's absolutely essential because this is the overriding thing of what you're trying to accomplish if you don't have this goals document then you're really just running blind and you're going to not be as productive as this and make sure you definitely check and cross measure to make sure you're tracking according to to the goals that you set, particularly the short-term goals that you set. So as I said, don't make it too hard, don't make it unrealistic, but at least have something. So I say to the couples, go away, and even the single people, go away. Just a weekend, take yourself out of your home environment so you've got no distractions. Sit down, discuss what you, where you want to be personally together, where you want to be financially, who's going to do what, and basically then come back and run with it, okay? Okay. Now, you're going to need to set up two teams. As a professional renovator, you're going to need your trade team and you're going to need a consultant, what I call a consultant design team, okay? So two very clear, distinct teams. Now, I've got some templates in the system. There's one called a consultant team, okay? There's also one called a trade team. So these are all on the templates list that you've just got this morning. So what I want you to do now is I want you to start finding people. Once you've chosen your target suburbs, I want you to start finding people in your local area who you can basically start filling out these templates because the last thing you want to be doing is to come and find an unrenovated property, a cosmetic reno, and you're starting, you're settling in six weeks' time, and suddenly you don't, you've not only got to organise the project and the materials and you're going and buying your bases and stuff, but you've also got to find your, all your consultants as well. So if you can start, you can start doing this legwork now so that when you're ready to go, when you actually find a deal, you're ready to go. So there's no reason why you can't start to hunt these people down right now. And look, they're very easy to find. Um, you know, even if you go onto council's website, um, quite often you can... In fact, I might actually just quickly pop, pull this up for you. I wasn't planning on showing you this, but... Even if you go onto like your local council website, a great way to find consultants, I'll just type in Leichhardt Council. If you go onto the planning and development section, that's where all the development applications are lodged. So you're going to have to find, if you're doing structural renos, you're going to have to find an architect, you're going to have to find a structural engineer, hydraulic engineer. And it's great if you can actually find those people who are doing stuff in your local area, not out of towners. So here is where it says application tracking online. So quite often you can go into those, those, um, that section 
and it pulls up all the development applications. So I agree, it's just terms and conditions. And you can actually type in, uh, la, 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 la. I'll just, I know that the GA is in Leica, but we, we were in 2011, I don't know, um, 47, I don't know whose DA this is, but we'll soon find out. And we'll hope those codes work. <laughs> How good am I? Um, all right, so it's bringing up all the development applications. So I've just typed in a, so I know that with like our council, they always have like D, development, and then it's the year 2000 slash something. So I've just typed, so the 47th, app, number 47th is the 47th application to be lodged this year. So what you can do is you can go in and it says show. So you just click into the properties. And so you can sort of tr scroll through this and it will actually bring up the architectural plans. And you know how the architectural plans always have the footers? The headers and footers on the top of the plans. Quite often they'll have um, structural engineering drawings. So I've just pulled up this one. Uh, CC application received. What was this one? Value um, alterations and additions to existing. So normally what they do in this section here, they have the structural engineering drawings. They have all the development application plans. You just click into them. You can open the architectural plans and you can get from the header and footers of all the design diagrams. You can get all the contacts of people who are doing the consultants in your local council right now. That's a really quick way of doing that. And you can start doing that now, rather than leaving. Because if you leave everything to the last minute, you're going to be bombarded. OK. So if you can start filling out the consultant team. So that's your interior designer, your architect, structural engineer, hydraulic engineer, uh, draftsman. Um, and that's pretty much it, I think. Um, who have we got? Oh, your lawyer, sorry, your lawyer, your property accountant. Um, if any of you guys want to use my lawyer, he's absolutely fantastic. All my students absolutely love him. Williams Roncolato is the company name. But if you need those details, just email our office and we'll give those to you. Um, so you need a property accountant. Darren, certainly in the room, my personal accountant. Property lawyer, property finance person. You can use my finance person that I'm bringing up tomorrow. I can use your own. There's no pressure to use any of my consultants, by the way. Um, architect, town planner. So particularly if you're going to be dealing in the inner city locations, you might want to find yourself a planner, surveyor, structural engineer, hydraulic engineer, geotech, which does soil testing, and a basics consultant, certifier, quantity surveyor. So they're all the people what I call in their suits, okay? These are not trade people on site. These are the people on the suit that you pay a fee to do a design drawing of some way, shape, and form. So if you can find those people sooner rather than later, you're going to um, be ready to rock and roll day one. Okay, these are the core people, regardless of whether you're doing a, 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 well, these are mainly structural renovations, but the main people out of your consultant team are your project manager, so um, i.e. yourself, your property lawyer, your property accountant, your property financier, your architect, and the builder. They are the core ones. So if you have to focus on the priorities, those five people are your absolute priority to try and get these people established now. So start liaising, like send them an email saying, looking at doing a structural renovation in the next year. Um, can you send me a fee, like what your fee proposals are? Like start getting all that stuff done now so you're ready to go when the deal comes along. Okay. You need to find a property lawyer. Now, there's lots of legal professionals. There's general lawyers, there's property lawyers, there's commercial lawyers, there's trademark lawyers. There's all sorts of variances of different legal people. And what you need to find is a property lawyer, OK? If you use a general lawyer, what will happen is that they will actually spend more time trying to find out the information. Meanwhile, you're paying them on an hourly basis. And half the time, they'll come back to you with information that may not be technically correct. When you also use a general lawyer, what happens is that they're not aware of creative loopholes because they're not living and breathing property day in, day out. So you've got to find yourself a property lawyer who specialises in property. And as I said, you're more than welcome to use mine uh, for all the people in Sydney. Um, otherwise, you know, certainly go out to so ask the questions. They have to specialise in property. You need to find a property... Yes? Williams Roncolato. Um, so they're in um, Elizabeth Street, Sydney, and the guy, my, my uh, lawyer is Paul Roncolato, and he's actually a real lawyer that you can actually have a conversation with. So, yeah, really nice guy, very helpful. It bends over backwards for our students. Okay, find a property accountant. So you, again, like the property lawyers, you need to get an accountant who specialises in property, not your general accountant, because again, a property accountant will know all the ins and outs, the rules and regulations of properties, where you will, what you can get away with, what you can't get away with. So you have to find a property accountant. Hi, Cherie. Uh, would you know of um, good property lawyers in um, Brisbane? 
I don't. I don't, unfortunately. But um, when the forum, we've got our private web forum, so when that comes up, put a post a message on the forum, which will be in the next couple of weeks, post a message, and I'm sure all the Brisbane students, we've got hundreds of students in Brisbane, I'm sure somebody will be able to give you a really good recommendation. Thank you. Yep. That, just on that, for the guys, the forum, so we're going to launch that within the next two weeks, and you'll basically, every single person in this room will be able to talk to all of my graduates nationally, which is about 1,500 people. So anyway, regardless of where you are, South Australia, Brisbane, Perth, we've got um, students all over the country. So that's where you get onto the forum and say, I'm looking for a structural engineer. Has anybody got a good contact in such and such? area so make sure you utilize that forum it's been built for you accountant. property accountant he's in the room yes and he services all our students nationally so um, yeah again I'm very well respected with our graduate community okay now you have to one of the things that you're going to do as part of your step-by-step -step process is that you have to meet with your property accountant first to determine what is going to be the best structure for you Darren's going to talk about this in the next session the reality is tax is not always the most exciting thing to talk about would you agree and while I love Darren um, the reality is you know tax can be a little a little bit boring so but it is absolutely essential that you get your property structure settled right because I didn't do this again. There was nobody around to mentor me when I started. I've learned the hard way. I've made every conceivable mistake, you name it. So I bought a lot of properties under my personal name and in true fact, I should never have bought them in my personal name. I've paid more capital gains tax than what I should have. I've got absolutely no asset protection whatsoever. So if I ever got sued, those assets are at, at risk. So it was a situation where those properties have to be transferred into a company name and I subsequently had to pay um, um, the stamp duty all over again. So on my properties, it's a $40,000 hit every time you buy a property in Balmain just for stamp duty. Very expensive lesson. So you're going to basically walk out of this workshop and you need to meet with your property accountant to work out whether or not you should do your first deal under your personal name. So that might be a situation where you do your first deal under your personal name, um, particularly the owner occupier, so you don't pay any tax. And then moving into project number two, you do it as a company or if you've got kids and things you can just disperse to, you basically do it as a trust structure. I think you all probably want to aim for a trust structure, but I can't really advise you anything more than that because I'm not licensed financially and that's that's why uh, Darren's going to cover that with you in a, um, after this break. Hi, it's Teresa. Um, I have several properties and unfortunately they're all cross collateralised. So yeah. I'm wondering whether it's best to just sell everything and start again or... Um, so what I you need to do is um, my recommendation to you would be to speak to both Darren and also Paul from the finance perspective. He might be able to unravel it for you but you need to speak to those two people to work out your strategy and if you're stuck then you come back and speak to us okay, at Renovating you. for Profit. Thank you. Okay, need to find a good architect or a draftsman. So for those people who are going to be doing a structural renovation you need an architect or a draftsman. I'll talk about the differences in step number six um, because the reality is for low budget renos you're probably more likely to use a draftsman. For higher value properties, you're going to use an architect. So you need to establish those relationships. You need to find an architect who is doing deals in your suburb. Don't ever use an architect from out of town because what happens is while they understand the principles of architecture, there are little nitty gritty factors and little intricacies um, in every single suburb that only a local architect would know. And I see all the time local um, out of town architects who come into the Leichhardt um, municipal, mis, minis, oh. yeah. thank you. Um, I, I see architects that come into my area and basically they overdevelop the site and they put things on that you just you go, what were they thinking? And it's because they don't know the tiny little things that a local t a local architect would actually know. So make sure you use local people and that's where you would jump onto the local council website and find those people right there and there. So it's not hard. Okay. You need to find a good builder. So start start pricking your ears up now so start you're going to be like on a radar now where everything like walking out of this workshop you're going to basically have the radar on for trying to attract all sorts of people in the property game so what you're going to do is as part of your step number two you're going to be driving the streets looking at properties as well and so what you want to do is you want to basically try and find builders and where you can find builders is on local like builders who are working in your local area on local building sites Every suburb you go into, there's either some form of new house being built or some house being renovated. There's always lots of fences, um, you know, the temporary, mesh, temporary fencing all around the properties. The builders always hang their signs as part, of the, as part of the site requirements. So start jotting down numbers. You need to keep a notepad in your car and you need to start jotting down the numbers of builders, tradies on the road, all sorts of things. So I'm going to talk about this in step number seven, but start getting, start putting the seed, planting the seeds for signing so that when you're ready to go, it's a matter of just you've done their check 
checks, you know, you've, you know they're good, they do their style of housing, you're ready to rock and roll as soon as you start to, um, as soon as you exchange that contract. Okay, now in terms of your actual company, you need to choose a company name that reflects the nature of your business and you need to choose a company name that is going to suit you long term. In fact, I'm actually at a bit of a dilemma right now in that, you know, six to, and I'll give you this as a practical, because I think if I give you examples, it will help you understand more. Um, you know, 16 months ago, I established my speaking business, which is obviously renovating for profit. Now, my focus is, and my focus always will be on renovating, but, you know, I'm developing also now a developing, lots of my students are asking to go to the next stage, so I'm developing a developing course. Now, if I'm actually selling a developing course as well, the name renovating for profit is a little bit, doesn't really fit. Can you see what I mean? So in your businesses, what you need to do is, um, I've had students in the past where they've gone out and they've called, you know, called their... Um, their companies like Keith's Renovations. And that's fine for the first two or three years, but as you start to get more money behind you, you will naturally transition into property development. And so you might have been Keith's Renovations over here, but three years down the track, you're doing property developments. The name Keith's Renovation doesn't really suit your company anymore. So if you can think a bit broader about that, and what you want to do is you want to choose a company name that basically has some like something generic. So I'd, I'd call it like... Um, um, something property group or something property developments because um, basically what you want to do is your company name is so important because when you get on the phone to deal with all these consultants, your architect, your builder, all the tradies on site, you want to be ringing, you want to be ringing, you want to be saying, hi, this is Cherie from City Living Property Developments, okay? They are going to automatically know straight off the bat that you are in the game of the property business. Now, if I'm on site and I ring up and say, Hi, this is Cherie. Can you give me a trade price, please? On oh, no, the first question they're going to say is, um, "Where are you from, Cherie?" I'm just, you know, Cherie. I'm not going to get trade price. But if I ring up a supplier and I say, "Hi, this is Cherie from City Living Property Developments. Can I have the builder's price, please, on four lengths of four by two, whatever it may be?" I don't get questioned. I've been doing this for 10, 11 years. I've never. Been, I always get builder's pricing. I have the balls to ask for it. Okay, but. I've never been questioned once whether or not I'm a builder because of my company name, okay? So you have to give your, your, your company name really careful consideration. You're going to have two company structures. It's basically, um, and Darren's going to talk about this in a bit more detail, but I'll just, I'll quickly show you so you understand. You're going to have two companies. If you're going to, most of you are going to be going up and setting up a trust structure and there's two entities with the companies. You've got your PTY LTD company here. So this would be called, um, let's just, well, my company name is, uh, one of my company names is called City Living Property Developments, okay, over here. And the other, your trust, is going to be called, I've got a, a trust that says, you know, Barbara and Tolly Family Trust, over here. Now, with the properties, that when you buy the property, the actual ownership is in the trust. The trust owns the property, okay? And all your expenses, all your day-to-day -day expenses, like your architect's fee, your council fees, your trade, all the fees you pay your tradies on site, they all come through here. So all your expenses come through here. No expenses come through this trust. And this is only the ownership. So when you ring up, like banks don't want you, the, the ownership goes in here. So you never, ever call your trust city living property developments. The banks don't like the word property developments, property renovator. They don't like to see flipping. So you always keep this fairly generic, uh, you know, family name, barber family trust, whatever it may be. And the actual operating company, which is where all your expenses go through, that is the company name that you have your property developments, property group, whatever it may be, okay? So you want to have a company name that you can get trade discounts and a company name where all these consultants that you're going to start to establish relationships know that you are now a serious person, that you have set this up as a company. Okay, avoid using the word renovations in your company name, as I said, because it'll reflect what you're doing right now, but it won't reflect what you're doing perhaps in three years' time. So they're just some of the logos. So I've obviously got all stationery, all sorts of things for my logos. Okay, 
what you need to do is you need to create a company profile. Now, I've given you a sample of my, um, one of my very early ones. Okay, so you've got all these little things. You don't have to recreate them from, you know, from scratch, but these will give you a good idea. This is just done in PowerPoint. It doesn't need to be um, elaborate by any means. And what I do is that when I go in, and what you all need to do is that when you're out now starting to go out and meet with agents, because what we're trying to do is, we as I said, we're trying to get you out of that amateur weekend warrior mode, and we start to establish your profile as a professional property person. So if you go to Officeworks, you buy these covers for about $30 or $40, and what I recommend you do is you create your own, your own company profile, and basically where you go out and it just has, you know, your so you need to develop your logo, which I'll talk about shortly, um, get all your sort of corporate identity stuff developed, and, you know, just tell them it is what it, what it, what it is that you do. So this is very simple. It just says, you know, City Living Properties is a small but successful renovation company. We buy property, we flip it for a profit, um, about adding value to residential real estate, whatever it may be. You just copy my template if you want, okay? Um, it talks about our core business, you know, obviously you have this picture of property. It talks about who I am and my experience and then basically a little bit of company information. And then as you start to do more projects, what you can do is you can start to put before and after pictures of the project. So when you are trying to go in and establish a relationship with a new structural engineer or a new architect or even a new real estate agent that's come into the, to the local market, you can take this in and you can show them these sorts of things. You say, look, I buy houses like this and I renovate them so they look like this and I flip them for a profit. Um, so if you bring me deals, you know, I'm more than happy. I do these sorts of deals. If you can bring me these sorts of deals, great, we can do business together. So you just basically, you know, go through and you show them. Obviously, you're going to have to, um, um, you know, you won't have some of these. Obviously, I've got them because I've got a track record now. But you need to start building this sort of thing. And so it's a very simple little tool that will help you just look, even like just walking in with this case to a real estate agency when you're trying to develop a relationship, even just walking in with this silly little plastic case, it can be the little things that just make that to set you apart from everybody else who doesn't think to do these simple little things. So I'll leave that out for you in the break so you can leave that on the meal tables. Okay, so that, that won't take you long. It'll literally take you a couple of hours. Make it till you make it, whatever, put whatever you want in there, okay? Make yourself look better than what you really are because um, the reality is you're, you're starting out from fresh, okay? All right, you need to produce an organisational chart. Now, as part of your weekend away where you're going away to establish your business, particularly for all the hubbies and wives in the order, I know there's quite a few of you, what you need to do is you need to assign areas of responsibility for who's going to be looking after what. I've produced the templates in my system, so your organisational charts are already done. And this is actually one of the charts that should go into your company profile. Now, when the agent goes, the reality is you might be a business of one, but so who cares? So you basically, there's a company organisational chart for just one director. So it might be, say, it might be okay to have Cherie there. Cherie, 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 Cherie. <laughs> That's cool, okay? But they can see, even by breaking these up into these business units, they can see that you're now starting to do renovations in a professional capacity. You know, it's just, as I said, taking you out of that amateur league who loves absolutely nothing, and they can see you'll start to be a serious business person. So a lot of the templates that I've created for you are going to even just help you just portray the image that you are now semi-professional at this. So go away, put your name in there so you can type into all of these, print that out, put that into your organisation. You know, if you have to, put the family dog on some of the things, like they won't know the difference, all right? And so, you know, if you say, so you can say at least, you can say, look, this is my company, it's a very small company, um, I've got these people looking after these different business aspects, if you just contact me in the first instance, I can handle it from there. So put it in, it's just going to, can you see like tiny little things that can just make tiny difference? Um, also, that organisational chart, for the couples, it's really, Im really important that you do that because, let me tell you, it's one reason why Steve and I had so many fights on site in our early days is because we didn't have clear lines of responsibility, so he wanted to do stuff that I wanted to do, um, were overlapping, we were, then there was parts of us where we weren't doing either of what we should be doing, so you need to go away on that weekend away and you need to sort of work out, okay, um, sorry, what's, what's your lovely couple over here, what's your names? Arif? Harva? Okay, cool. Um, so Arif and Harva might say, okay, um, Harva, you might be better at the business administration side. Women tend to you know, generally be better with the admin sort of stuff. Um, Arthur? Arf? Arif, okay. Arif, you might say, um, look, I might, I'll do the suburb and the property due diligence. Um, and so you're basically going to go through and you're going to allocate areas of responsibility. And that's your area. So what you want to do is you want to try and separate 
have just clear lines of responsibility so you don't get in arguments and so and that's why that weekend away is perfect for just distinguishing that. Okay, business insurances. You're also going to have to go out and get some business insurances as a renovator. You need workers to insurance policies, workers' compensation and public liability. Now, workers' comp, you only need this if you're going to be working on site yourself. Um, if you're going to be hiring staff, you need it to cover any staff. So you might hire your own labourers, for example, whatever it may be, or you might hire an admin person to help with logging your expenses. So that just covers your em direct employees if they trip over, fall over and have an accident. The other one that you need is public liability insurance. Now, the reality is um, that covers anybody that comes onto your site from having an accident. Your builder will have their own public liability insurance. Um, all your tradies will have their own public liability. But for me, as an owner of a property business, I also have a public liability just to cover me. So in fact, there's actually three sets of pub if you look at it in true respects there's actually three sets of public liability your tradies have got it your builders got it i've got it because sometimes what can happen is an accident might happen on site and the insurance companies will say well who was at fault why was there an electrical lead running across the hallway when Joe, the cement render, was walking down carrying a bag of cement and some other tradie pulled um, electrical lead from room to room to start drilling something whose fault was that was that Joe, the cement renderers no it was is it the builders <coughs> Yeah, can it be the builder? So quite often the insurance company won't pay out the, um, the actual tradie. They'll go to the builder or sometimes they'll come after the owner if the o owner was negligent. So they always look for who was the negligent party. So that's why it's always good just to have that third policy just in case. And you can buy that as an annual premium. Don't take that out until you're actually ready to do your first deal. So don't go out and get that this week. Just start getting quotes but basically have it ready. As soon as you get your first project and the day before you start construction, activate the policy. Hi, Shuri. I just wanted to ask, do you obtain that those insurances only for the renovation period? And does the insurance company allow that? No, they typically tend to be a one-year premium. So just activate it when you start your very first. So if you're in between projects, like if you do a cosmetic run-out, it takes six weeks, and then you don't do another one for four months. You've actually got four months of um, wasted insurance time. So unfortunately, you can't get it on a, on a per project basis, to my knowledge. But there's actually been some um, changes recently, and I've actually had a staff member trying to investigate it. But it's a really hard area to get correct answers. We've been waiting for over six weeks now from responses from the Housing Industry Association, and we keep getting mixed stories. So we're trying to get to the bottom of that. And we certainly, once we get those answers, we'll um, email blast that out to everybody. But yeah. These costs you need to factor into your um, feasibility. Feasibility. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Cool. Yep. Thank it's you. It's a cost of doing business. Uh, sure. I'm just assuming that one of those um, things that you can't get answered is whether you have to cover your tradies. Um, um, no, your tradies have their own cover. Particularly in Perth, um, have an issue there where there's a very grey pool of whether you, you, as the developer or the builder, have to actually cover your own. Uh, cover actual tradies, not just your direct employees? You, sh you shouldn't, and that's why, uh, I mean, that question hasn't been raised before, but we'll certainly, we'll certainly get that answer as well. But to my knowledge, your tradies have your own um, public liability insurance, your builder has public liability insurance, and then you as a project manager. S sorry, not public liability, but... Um, workers' comp? Workers' compensation. No, that's not your responsibility as a project manager. That is the responsibility of the actual tradie. And okay. if you've been taught, if you... To my, well, that's my knowledge. Yeah, just in, I'm, I'm not sure that's why I'm asking, yeah. but in yeah. Perth, to my understanding, because I've been uh, approached by uh, the government sort of thing saying, yep. are you covered for your tradies? Um, um, so if you're if doing you employ... an owner-builder, you may need to get that coverage, but apart from that, um, tradies have their own individual public liability insurance, which is one of the checks that I'll cheat you in step number seven. But you know what, we'll check that for you, because um, if something's changed, we'll certainly check that. So Julie, if I can put that down as an action task for you to note, or Sonia, could you just note that as an action task for one of the team members? So we'll find that out for you, but to my knowledge, um, what I know is that um, tradies have their own public liability insurance. Yep. And workers' comp, absolutely. Sorry, workers' comp, sorry. Okay, any other questions? No, cool. All right, um, just with your insurance, typically how it happens, if you buy an unrenovated property right now, you can ring up and from the, you know, from the, literally from the time you buy the property, I would encourage you, as soon as you sign the contract, I would encourage you to take out the insurance at that point, not the time that you actually get the keys, because sometimes with the insurance companies, if the house burns down in between that settlement period after you've signed a contract, you could actually lose the property. So always try and take out your insurance from the time that you actually sign the, the, the contract goes un un condition, unconditional. And basically, so what you can do is, th there's actually some levels of insurance here. Once your renovation, once your property turns into a construction site, a renovation site is completely different insurance. 
when you buy a house right now that you're not intending to renovate, it's just normal building and contents insurance, okay? So you can take out normal building and contents insurance up until the time that you're doing any works. As soon as you start works, it then becomes construction or risk insurance, okay? You go through the renovation process, so that's what's going to cover you for the construction or risk insurance. As soon as you finish the renovation, that policy can be cancelled and basically you then revert back to normal building insurance. Um, do you usually have to take contents insurance before you start a reno? When, when well, you're normally still you don't have out? any contents in there as an unrenovated property. But be empty. when you still rent it out before? Uh, well, there'll, there'll only be building insurance, not okay. um, contents. So there's actually two insurances. There's just You can get building, uh, building insurance, which covers just the physical building, and then contents is your TV and your stereo within the property. So as renovators, you're going to be buying um, vacant property, so you just need building insurance, not the contents aspect. Yep. Okay, you need to get, as part of your setting up your property business, you need to get uh, business cards produced. You need to get two business cards produced. First one, just is, first of all, your standard business card, so that when you start to now go out to the real estate agencies and start to develop those relationships, you go there and say, hi, I'm Cherie from City Living Property Developments, okay? Again, little things that just, it's a complete package that makes you look professional. Um, what you also need to do is you need to develop a personal business card that has absolutely no... Uh, company signage whatsoever, corporate identity on it. Now, where would you possibly need this card for? Yep, so when you're door knocking, when, you walk along, when you're walking the dog on a Sunday afternoon, you say a great unrenovated shack, then you think that's a deal. When you go and knock on the door, do you think you want to be knocking on, talking to Nanny and saying, hi, I'm Cherie from City Living Property Developments? Do you think that? No, like you get a bite in the butt from the dog. Um, so what you want to be doing though is you want to be basically taking your personal business card like that there on the screen where it basically has no corporate identity. You say, look, I'm Cherie. I'm really interested in buying your house. If at any stage um, you want to sell it, um, just give me a call, okay? So it's much better to do that. So make sure you have to. And you get those, you know, those vending machines in the shopping centres and the, there's a place here in Roselle that does them for $99 for a thousand of them plain on business, um, plain unbranded business cards, so you can get them really, really cheap. So what you're going to find is working out from this workshop, you're going to have to buy a few little things, a few little um, tools like the plastic folders and project management case, um, little things that are going to start to set you up as a professional property person. Um, Mike's down here, thanks. While I'm waiting for those. Okay, what you need to do is you need to develop an email signature. You're going to be sending lots of emails for quotes, supplies, all sorts of things to your suppliers. So make sure you go and develop an email signature. So you've got your company logo. So you're going to have to get engage a graphic designer up front and you're going to need to get them to develop these sorts of things for you. Make sure you have some letterhead, okay, ready to go so you can confirm correspondence to your consultants. As I said, you, you, can, you can either do it the professional way or you can send it out on a blank piece of paper what's going to look better, okay? Just really basic. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to get all these basic corporate identity stuff. Obviously, you fax letterhead. Um, get those sort of set up because you're going to be, uh, again, faxing sketches, all sorts of things. Now, I've even gone so crazy with my templates that I've even developed the quotation request for the graphic designer. So you don't actually, <laughs> you don't actually have to produce this. So just pull that, print that out from your manuals, um, fax it, email to them, and that will basically say, please give me a quote for all of these things and all of the things that we're discussing right now. So I've already done that for you. Can I suggest maybe a fridge magnet for Granny? So she doesn't lose the Ooh. card. Yeah. Oh, now you're getting creative. I yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, I think we should have another template or add that to your yeah. template. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can I can develop the artwork. <laughs> That's a good idea. So you're still thinking. Um, so Tim, is it? Yep. Yeah. So Tim's thinking outside the square. Like you're being creative. So again, things that people just wouldn't think to do. My grandmother, her whole fridge is full of magnets. So you've got to think. A lot of the properties that you will be buying will be from older people who just want to move into a nursing home or whatever it may be. So that's a fantastic idea. I might have to do a video just on that. Okay. Oh, just in relation to um, business cards, I actually got them for free on the internet. So I can email you through the link. You can oh, get great. like 500 free business cards and all you do is pay for postage and handling. Oh, we like that, don't we, guys? Yeah. Free business cards. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So if you send that through, I'll email that out. Okay, yes. Um, with regards to the email, do you recommend putting a picture of yourself down the bottom? You know how you sign off your, your normal details? I, I, I don't personally like it. It's okay if you're like um, Claudia Schiffer, but um, yeah, most of us aren't. So I don't know. Uh, one of my graduates does have it. Um, I don't know. I just personally don't like it, but it's up to you. It's, yeah. I've never done it. I've just had my, I mean, you can see my email signature, which is just there. It's very corporate. 
Um, you just got to think big business. Even though you're a very small entity, you might be a one-man show. Just always think big picture um, of what you can be and what can you, you can become. So I don't know. I don't personally like the photos, but it's... Who, who likes the photos? We'll do a survey. If you, who, who likes um, email signatures with photos? Who doesn't? Yeah, well, there you go. There's your answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, cool. So de- make sure you develop your company stationery. Okay, weekly planner. What you want to do is, again, start... Um, who uses daily and weekly to-do list, to list at the moment? Reality is you're going to have a lot of stuff to do as a renovator. If you're going to be doing this seriously, you're going to be getting phone calls from agents, all sorts of things. So just try and manage your time because, as I said, a big part of why I've been so successful in renovating is because I've got, I'm very extremely organised when it comes to my renovation. Personal life is all over the place, but work-wise, um, really great. So make sure you do a weekly planner. Start allocating chunks of time for you to focus on your, your property business and basically plan your time. You want to make sure there's a template in there. So you can just, all these templates are on your seat. You just print them out every single day. So there's a, we- a daily to-do list. So every day I come into the office or I'm on a renovation site, I make a list of what I've got to do that day. When I've got a list, I'm more likely to achieve it. I tick it off, done, done, done. And then I know what's outstanding at the end of the day. Whatever I don't get through on the day, that goes as the first priority on the second day. So make sure you use those basic things. Okay, you've got to maintain thorough business records. Um, I've developed a template for you in terms of a file notes. So what you need to do is when you start um, properties, these are like a picture of my property folders, but what you need to do is get go to office work, start to set up, like you can do this right now, you can go and buy a four, three ring binder and every property goes in one folder. Sometimes if you're doing a big structural renovation, you might actually, one property deal might be over three or four projects. And in fact, what I do these days, I'll just quickly grab it. I wasn't actually planning on showing you this, but what I do, oops, wrong case. So what I do is I tend to have these these cases and I take them on site with me. So I will talk to you about this in step number seven. But pretty much, um, so I'll end up, for a big structural renovation, I'll end up with three or four of these cases and they have all my files in it. And at the end of the project, they're all neatly there. I archive them away, keep them for seven years, whatever it may be, and they're done. So be really organised with your stuff because... Um, I wasn't so organised with this in the beginning and um, particularly the first time I appeared on Today Tonight, about a week later I got a letter from the tax department saying, uh, Dear Cherie, as per your interview with Today Tonight, um, please furnish all the dates you bought property, sold property, um, please provide evidence of your tax payments. It took me like a whole week to basically trawl through my properties and go through all the details and try and find the dates. It was an absolute nightmare. So what I did is this um, puff from just walking down the stairs. That's really bad. Um, This file, so every property that you're going to start to do, start to set up your property reference folder. I've actually, in your manual summary, I think it might be the next slide, I've actually given you the tabs, the key tabs that you need to put inside those dividers. If I was really good, I would have provided those to you, but uh, no go. So, um, So what I want you to do is I want you to basically put them in that section and you'll notice that the acquisition goes at the back of the file. So this actually works in reverse order. Put the acquisition stuff at the very back and then work your way. So your property sales should be the one on top because otherwise if you do it the other way around, you're going to be constantly putting the projects from because you only acquire a property once. So follow those tabs and then basically whenever something comes up, so when you speak to your accountant or the surveyor's coming out on Monday, just use this template which is called file notes. Say surveyor coming out Monday 10th of June, whatever it way, quoted $600. Just pop it into the folder and that's all you do. Because let me tell you, and when you dispose of a property, say property sold 10th of June, whatever it may be, um, 600000 whatever it may be, file it in. Because going back on history you'll need all these little details because something will pop out at some say and you'll have to justify dates um, to the Office of State Revenue or whatever it may be. The Office of State Revenue always has a, you know, they always keep an eye on property investors, developers, so it's just good to have. So be very organised with this. Um, print, like, print 100 of them out and like, have a little stash of them in your home office. What you'll probably do is, what, you, what I recommend is that you go and allocate a portion of your house to now become your, your office. Um, when I first started out, I actually converted part of the garage, just put a desk in there. I had all my maps of my local suburbs. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, try and put a dedicated property area in your house because if you actually have a little zone, you're more likely to actually do something in your property business than rather try and do this on the lounge watching Foxtel. So um, it's, that's, that's the best thing to do. All right. 
Whenever you sell a property, make sure that you notify the Office of State Revenue. Um, there's a form on the, on the Office of State Revenue's website, so when you dispose of a property, if you don't notify them, what will happen is you'll get a land tax bill for any property that's held over um, 31st of December, and sometimes the government departments have a lag of like three, six months, so if you actually proactive with sending the form in, they'll get it straight away, and what will happen is you'll, you'll actually stop you getting that land tax bill. You can always reverse them, but you have to write a letter, and you know, it's just, it's another thing you have to do unnecessarily, so be on top of your paperwork. Okay. What you want to do, this is a big one, guys, so pay attention to this. What you want to do with your renovation projects is you want to develop a cookie cutter template for your reno projects. Do you know what I mean by that? Okay, does anybody not know what I mean by that? Okay, so basically you want to choose a colour scheme. You basically want to choose a formula that you replicate from project to project to project. What you don't want to be doing is reinventing the wheel on every, second pro every project that you do. So on my very first project, I developed a cookie cutter template. I, got a good, I hired a Dulux colour consultant. So she basically, I paid her $300. She gave me a really good colour scheme of pal um, palette of colours. I did my cabinetry, blah, blah, blah. I got my stone colour. So I spent a lot of time on my very first project hunting around for all of those materials. And what most people do is that most people, they'll do that on their very first project. They'll go into their second project and they'll think they'll have to go and do something bigger and better. So they look, start looking at new paint swatches. They'll go and start looking at different cabinetry types. They, they think, I'll get bigger and better. And you don't necessarily need to do that. So I used this cookie cutter template on my first one. I used it on my second project. So I thought, well, it worked on my first one. If you know that theory, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I used it on my first, I used it on my second, my fifth, my tenth. I'm using it today on my 27th renovation, okay? So you can go all over Balmain, Roselle, and use basically a smorgasbord of cream colour houses with blue roof. So I've, I've actually itemised my cookie cutter template in thorough detail for everything, my shower screens, my floorboard colours, cabinetry type, everything. Now, you don't have to follow this because I don't want, I'm not certainly saying I want you to be mini-me's. I'm just trying to teach you that whatever works for you, choose a good colour. Now, with these colours, let me say to you, a, a lot of my students right across Australia are using these colours. They are absolutely sensational. The properties that I renovated 10 years ago look like they've just been renovated yesterday. So they're classic colours that will not date. They buyers love them. So I would say if you're not if you're okay, go to Bunnings, get a little sample pot, you know the little sample pots of paint. Go to Bunnings, get pay six dollars for the sample pots of each of these colours. Have a look. Camille, do we have um sorry, do we have my big folder? My can I quickly have that? You know, my cookie cutter folder with the um, swatches and things? Um, so we'll just grab that. Uh, I was going to show you that in step seven, but I'll quickly show you. So what? Um, so if you can try and use those paint colours, because let me tell you, paint is so critical. If you just even get the shade wrong, it can mean the difference of somebody buying your house and not buying your house. So regardless of whether you use mine or you wanted to develop your own, try and get a cookie cutter template that you can replicate. Because what it means is it saves you cutting out time having to go find new paint swatches, new cabinet maker, and when you make those mistakes, like when you do, when you change something, you're more open to making mistakes. I'm actually experiencing this on my, my current project. This project that you'll see next week is the very first project where I deviated away from my cookie cutter template. I had this sales rep come to me with the, t the sandstone tiles. She showed me these tiles and I said they're absolutely beautiful tiles. So she showed me the wall and the floor tile. I always put iron, iron bark floorboards in all of my, every single project I've done has always been floorboards. This is the very first house I've actually put tiles. And you know, those tiles, the reality is to lay them and buy the tiles was about $60,000 and I'm currently deciding whether I rip those tiles up or not because they don't look as good as floorboards. Very first time I've deviated away, and that's why I'm saying to you, if you can find something that works, stick with it because to me, if I decide to rip them, and I'll let you decide this when you come out next week, see if you like them, but when you come out, when, when, you, make these, when you change away from a formula that works, you can lose money. So really try and develop that cookie cutter template. Okay. Start nurturing relationships with the right people. So you're going to be in the property business. A lot of this business is about networking. I can ring, you know, if I was to ring up all the real estate agents right now, they'd say, you know, I love working with Cherie. So I've fostered those relationships over time. Um, it's the big one, the big one with the, you know, the paint swatches. Yep. Um, so try and start networking with the right people. One of the core people that you need to start networking with is real estate agents, okay? So start having meetings with them. Um, one of the things I want you to do is what I call an agent's brief. This is a template within your manual. 
what I want you to do is I basically want, this is a sheet that, go, that basically says who you are. So what I want you to do is I want you to start now ringing real estate agents and I want you to start setting up meetings. So don't do it right now. I want you to do this at about the three month mark after you've done your suburb due diligence. So what you want to do is this is a sheet that basically says your name, where you're from. So Sheree, I'm from City Living Property Developments, my contact details about me. What it says is I'm ready to buy immediately. I'm a knowledgeable property professional. I'm a finance approved buyer. I'm a fast decision maker, willing to pay a good price for the right property. What's more important on this sheet is what the type of property that I'm wanting to buy. You can't go into a real estate agent and say, I want to buy an unrenovated property. It's like going into a car yard and saying, I want to buy a car. What's the first question that the car salesman is going to say to you? What sort of car do you want? Same with property. What sort of property do you want to buy? Do you want to buy an apartment? Do you want to buy a semi? Do you want to buy a freestanding house? Do you want to buy a $300,000 house? A $1 million house? What is it? So you need to determine what is it, the type of property that you're looking to buy. So for me, when I started out, my brief to the agents was, I'm looking for freestanding houses, something that I convert a two, three, or four better, that I can convert to a four or five bedroom family house, something on an average block size, um, something that has the potential for me to do a structural renovation. So I was very particular about the type of property that I was looking to buy. Because if you don't spell this out, like you're wanting now to get agents to bring property deals to you before they come on the mark or at least give you first bite of the charity, um, cherry. Because the reality is, is that a lot of properties actually sell in the market that don't even hit the market. Um, whether agents will admit, have we got any real estate agents in the audience? Great. Um, <laughs> now I can let loose. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had one in my last workshop. She had a very grumpy face by the time I finished the workshop. You are? Oh, okay. Are you a nice one? Oh, commercial. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so with um, with with real estate agents, um, they do have normally like their top five customers. When a hot deal comes in the market, they're more likely to phone the serious people like me and say, "Sheree, I'm renovated properties just come on the market. You interested? Yeah, absolutely. Show me what's your address." So you need to now aim to be on their favourites list, and there are ways that you can actually start to get out of the favourite list. If you don't do these sorts of things, what's going to happen? You're going to go in the crowd with all the other um, weekend warriors, and they're not going to give you any priority. So when you fill out this agent's, this, um, agents brief, what I want you to do, at the three month mark after you've done your suburb due diligence and you're knowledgeable, I want you to go into the, set up meetings with the real estate agent, I want you to take your company profile in, I want you to take this company sheet in, so ring them up and say, let's say, let's say for the purpose of the exercise we're going to be dealing with Chris the real estate agent which is one of my favourite agents in Balmain. If I was establishing that relationship with Chris, what I'd do is I'd bring up Chris, say, hi, Chris, I'm actually looking to buy some property. Can I actually come in and brief you on the type of property that I'm looking to buy? And so I would take it in, take this sheet in. So run off about 10 copies because you want that, that key agent in that agency to give it to all the other agents in the agency. You don't want to be having 10 separate meetings with all the agents. And they always have a sales meeting once a week, most of these real estate agents. So you want to go in and say, look, Chris, I've actually set up a property business. It's called City Living Property Development. I'm looking at buying unrenovated houses in the area, getting in and renovating them very quickly, getting out and selling them for a profit. So I've set up this business called City Living Property Developments. I've actually, I just want to show you um, just a little about the company that I've established. So this is my company logo. Um, basically, uh, you know, this is a little bit about me, my experience. Um, I'm basically, and you might even want to, even if this, your portfolio doesn't have any pictures, you might even just want to steal some of mine. And, um, and, <laughs> and, and just basically say, look, not to say that you've done them, I like, don't take credit for my work, even though I'd be okay to let you do that. Um, but what you want to say is, look, I'm looking to buy sort of houses like this, you know, um, that's basically like this, unrenovated properties like this, where I can convert them like this. So paint the picture of the vision of your, what you're trying to do. Because a lot of people are visual, they, they need to sort of, you might go blah, 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 but they go, what's she talking about? But when they see it visually, it will help you. So even if you've got no projects, um, put these pictures in, and I'm certainly anybody that wants them, more than happy to give these to you, just so you can paint the picture of what you're trying to do. So then, so take your company portfolio into, and they'll be more than happy to read that, and just say, look, what I've done, Chris, I've done a, a brief as to the type of property. I know that you get a lot of properties on the market. I'm giving you a brief as to the type of property that I'm buying. So what I'm looking to do is buy, um, um, you know, freestanding houses, or I'm looking to do apartment renovations only, something that's not too blah, 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 blah. So you just specify what you do. You say, look, I'm, I'm ready to go. My finances is approved. I'm ready to go. I promise you I'm doing this professionally. I will make a fast decision for you. I will quickly crunch the numbers. 
says, I will let you know. I'll be straight up with you. I'll let you know whether a deal is a deal for me. I want to try and do business with you. Chris, I know that you um, probably have, you know, your top five favourite customers. Chris, how can I actually be one of those customers where you call me before these deals come on the market? Most people don't ever ask to do this and they don't get results. So you've got to step outside your... A lot of you would probably be scared at doing this, right? It's a bit nerve-wracking. Absolutely. If your heart's not jumping out of your skin, there's something wrong, right? Um, even today when I go to auctions, my heart still feels like I'm about to faint. So um, that's normal. That's a good feeling. So don't get scared of that. So most people don't fa fail to do this. Now what you do is you say, Chris, I've printed these out for you. Um, there's 10 of them. Um, would you mind just giving these to the uh, when you, in your next sales meeting at the end of the week or whenever it may be, your next sales meeting, would you mind just handing these out to all the other agents in the area and just pass on the conversation so they know that I'm a serious buyer? Like, and keep saying, I'm a serious buyer. I want to buy the right property off you right now. So keep saying that. You're, what you're doing, it's like you're doing a mini marketing campaign on yourself, okay? You're taking yourself out of that league from the weekend warriors who do absolutely nothing, who just wait for deals to come along. And we're taking you out of that league now. And we're putting you in the league of proactive renovator, somebody who's proactively starting to grow their business. So print it out. You say, Chris, um, is it possible you can print me? You know, hang, don't put me in the filing cabinet, Chris. Please put me, uh, hang me on your, on, your, on your cubicle so I'm top of mind. I want to do business with you. So you need to do this because if you do this, you've got a much higher chance of then start to giving you um, early access or basically letting you see properties as soon as they come on the market. Now, if you don't do this deal, this agent's briefing sheet, what will happen is Chris will get on the phone to you and they'll say, hi, Cheree, it's Chris from you know, LJ Hooker Balmain. Um, Look, uh, an unrenovated property's come on the market. It's a two-bedroom semi uh, on 200 square metres of land, uh, three be you know, two bedrooms. They want 600,000. You'll jump on the internet or you'll go look at the property and it's those, you know that little semi I showed you earlier that has no potential to do anything? You'll say, oh, sorry, Chris, no, nah, that, that one's not really a deal for me. I'll go, oh, okay. May not ring you back ever again at that point because you've said no. You phone you up another time, you'll say, hi, Sri, look, an unrenovated property's come on the market. They want 1.4 million. It's a structural renovation opportunity. Good, you know, good potential to do structural renos, but you're only at like a 900,000 affordability. Oh, Chris, yeah, it's a deal, but I can't afford it. I can't, I'm sorry, no. More times you say no, the less chance that they're ever going to go. It's like chipping away at, like a, at a block, and the more you say no, 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 no. So what you want to do is you want to start saying yes, 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 yes. And if you are a person that, can, that says yes, they will want to come and work with you time and time again. So when agents ring me, I drop everything straight away. Okay, tell me, tell me the deal. What, what's, what's the property, Chris? Quite often I'll have RP data. I'll pull it up if I'm in the office or if I'm on site with my laptop on site. I'll say, what's the address? I'll pull it up on RP data. I'll go, oh, yeah, that looks good. All right, hey, Chris, look, I'll drive past. I'll take a drive past in another hour, in about an hour's time. I'll give you a call back this afternoon. I'm, 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 at first glance, glance, I'm interested. I'll call you back. And if I'm interested, like I drive out to property, I know I'm if, I'm if I'm interested. You can tell, tell a lot by a property, just even externally. I'll ring them back and say, Chris, let's, let's talk. I'm interested in this property. Let's go. So they, they, I have these deals coming to me because I know I make fast decisions and I'm doing this professionally. Because agents are like any other person. They want to get in and out of the deal as quickly as possible. So they can sell to somebody who's professional and does this in a business-like manner. They will, they will start to bring deals to you. But you've got to do that in order to, to, to basically get that. Now, one thing that, and this is not in your manual, so you might want to write this down. This is pretty critical. I should add it to the manuals. I just keep growing in size, these things. Um, so what I did um, in my very early days, every, in my early days, what I did is um, every Wednesday and Thursday afternoon, there's about um, six, six agents, six core agents in Balmain, our six agencies, and every Wednesday afternoon between 3 and 5 p.m., guess what I did? I phoned every single one of them. So I got on the phone and said, hi, I'm Cherie from whatever my company name was back then. Um, in fact, I didn't, even, didn't even have a company name back then. Hi, Cherie. Um, look, hey, Monique, I'm just ringing you um, just to see if you've actually listed any properties this week that I can actually have an advanced look at before they come on the market. Now, you've got to remember, when somebody says to an agent, I'm going to sell my house, they sign the contract. What lead time is there roughly between the time it actually, they sign that contract to the time it actually has the first open for inspection? Any idea? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, that's... Buffer period, opportunity buffer period. So when somebody, when a vendor signs a contract for um, to sell a house with an agent, the agent's got to go off. They've got to write the text for the brochure. They've got to take photography, floor plan, um, photos, uh, whatever else they have to put on the internet. Get all the advertising schedule worked out, and that typically takes two weeks. That is a two-week window for you as a professional renovator to come in. So if you're really proactive, phoning the real estate agents every like do it at a set time. So I always did it either Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon always between 3 to 5 p.m., I would phone them everywhere and say, hi, Monique, 
Ed Sheree again, just seeing if there's any properties that um, have come onto the market this week that I can actually have a look at before the earth's first open for inspection. No, Sheree. Like I said last week, Sheree, no. Okay, no worries, Monique. I'll, I'll talk to you next week. Okay, down. <laughs> next week. So expect that. Expect them to go, no, look, love, I'll, I'll, I'll ring you. When a property comes up, ex love, I'll call you, all right? Speak to you next week. All right, so next week, you ring, 3 to 5 p.m. Hi, hi, Monique, it's Sheree again. Just seeing if there's any properties. So you just repeat the same thing. Hi, Sh Monique, it's Sheree again. Is there any properties that have come on the market that I can have a look at in advance? Lisa? Oh, Sheree, you're killing me. Come on, Monique, let me. Come on, Monique, I'm just trying to do a deal. Come on, help me out. You know, I really want to do a deal with you. So you've got to start just, you know, try, like, really ask for people for their help. And let me tell you, they're like, they're like, oh, God. All right, Sheree, go look at this. So, like, I have a saying, like, um, some, somebody said it, you know, persistence conquers resistance. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to be, you know, because what they'll see, they'll go, geez, this girl's gutsy. This girl really wants to do, she's persistent. So the more you get, so I've got lots of properties. I've been able to buy lots of properties off the market simply by making those phone calls every Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon. Now, I, I do it on those particular days for a reason. On Mondays, um, all the agents are phoning back people from the open for inspections or they're away. They normally have their day off. Um, Tuesday, a lot of agents have Tuesday off as well. Wednesdays and Thursdays are the day I call them because that's midweek. They're, they're typically quieter on those days. And Friday is a terrible day to call because they're all getting ready for the open for inspections on the Saturday. So Tuesday, Wednesdays are the day. You can, either, you can do it anytime, morning, afternoon, lunch, whatever it may be. But make sure it's a consistent and make sure you phone all of the core agents, like the main ones in your area, do this, this phone, phone call because this is going to get you deals now before that, in that two-week period. So what they'll say is, look, Sheree, I can't get you through the property, but you can take a drive pie. So quite often, as soon as they give me that address, and don't ever do any wrongdoing by a real estate once you undermine. Like if they say, look, Sheree, um, take a drive past. Um, you can't, I can't get you through just now, but take a drive past. Don't ever go and knock on the door of that owner and say, hey, yeah, I know you're selling your house. You know, can I do a deal? Because if you do that, you'll have a very short career as a professional renovator. Um, a couple of things. Yep. When you're talking about the the colours, what we found out, our next neighbour, we, we put a new roof onto our house and it was a, eight months later, my next neighbour put a new roof on but he couldn't use the same colours because the cancer had brought in a... Yep. Um, so then you just have to tweak, your, t yeah. tweak that part of your cookie cutter template. Yep. yep. And while I'm going, um, you know, you're saying about the, the real estate agent but going in and see them. What mm -hmm. I did is I went in and talk to the principal and say, can I just have two minutes of your time when you're having those meetings with everybody? Yep, and I beautiful, it's even better. And as you just reminded me to do, do you know what? Sometimes the smallest things can make a difference. So when you're going in for those meetings with a real estate agent, go at like morning tea time, stop by the local cake shop, buy a muffin or whatever, a chocolate eclair, whatever, take mm, it in so when you go in... Chocolate. Um, <laughs> so when you actually go in with your agent's brief, say, hey, Chris, um, nice to see you. Um, you know, I just want to brief you today and say, actually, say, look, it's morning tea time. I actually picked up, I picked up something, something little for morning tea for you. You know, do you think that muffin is going to make a difference? Like, I know it sounds crazy, but that's the difference that can people, people can say because you're, you're wanting to be a fairly tough strong person, I guess, projecting yourself as a business person when you may not necessarily have the skills. But what they can see is they can see Cherie is firm, but they can see also that Cherie's actually underneath all of that. Cherie's actually a really sweet, genuine, genuine, caring person. There's a nice, a softer side to Cherie. So it's just those little things that can get people to like you. Not hard, but very easy. If you go to an agent, there's maybe five, six, eight agents in that place? Do you just go to the principal one or how do you choose? Um, just the main one. So you can normally tell who's the main influencer. Right. So, and because you're going to see these agents at all the open for inspections as well. So you're going to know which ones are the good ones, which ones are the bad. So when we start to talk about step number two and step number three, property due diligence, you're going to find out who the good mm. ones in the area just by attending the open for inspections as part of that three month window. Right. Yeah. By the time you get to step number eight, you already know which agent you're going to be selling with from step number three. Okay. Um, Um, just in terms of, you've got to be a person, and this is really important, you've got to be a person that's very easy to do business with. I've got um, uh, some troublesome students who are quite demanding on agents' times and all that sort of stuff. So you've just, you just got to be a person, be conscious of how you deal with people. Don't be, you need to be firm, but not over the top. So when somebody says to you, I'll get back to you today, say, um, I presume that will be 5 p.m., okay? 
So that you don't want to do, okay? So just be conscious of that. And I know you laugh, but it's happening at the moment. Um, and it's, you know, what, the reason why people can either be your friend or be somebody that you want to do business with as opposed to somebody that doesn't want to do any business with you. So don't be a pain in the butt. Adjust your language to the person that you're talking to as well. So um, once you have good relationships with the agents, you can turn your language down a little bit as well. Um, and always do what you say, what you're going to do, particularly with the agents. Agents are very critical, okay? Because these are, I think, out of the whole the hardest part of the process, you know, getting the deals is going to be the, the it is going to be the hardest part finding a deal that stacks up so the more relationships you can have good relationships the better all right um can skip past that so brief sheet okay now just with your credits card system um uh, trying to get into the habit of charging everything in your renovation to your credit card there are two credit cards on the market that i'm aware of at this point in time that are absolutely great for your credit card uh, reward system so if you're smart with your renovations what you'll do is you'll charge absolutely everything your consultants fees some tradies can actually pay your trade fees on your credit card um you know your solicitors your accountants all that sort of thing you'll be amazed at how quickly the points rack up when you are renovating so um i I fly around the world. I fly around the world all the time, and over for the past 12 years, I've never paid for a single flight personally. It's all been from the rewards from my renovation projects. So typically, what I used to do before I started my public speaking business, I don't get any holidays now. Um, but what I used to do is I used to be on site for like four months. So I do I do a renovation. I then take um, a month or two off. I'd go hop overseas for a holiday. I'd come back and I'd start the next one. So I was going. I always rewarded myself with a holiday, and I never paid for that holiday. So the rewards that you the credit card points that you rack up will pay for your hotel and your flights because you um, will want to have a, you'll want to, you'll just want to feel like a break and then you start your next one the two system the two cards that you want to aim for are the Westpac um, altitude I think it's the Westpac altitude platinum cards um, that's where you get the bigger rewards and the Citibank Citibank platinum card I think it is and there's also the St George one is particularly good as well you know so you've got to compare apples to apples so it's the St George platinum card Citibank and the Westpac Platinum card. So just, um, I haven't looked at those for about six months, so just double check them. But when you convert them to frequent flyer points, which is what you want, so you want one that's particularly good for frequent flyer points so you can go on holiday. Um, when you convert them from the points in your account to frequent flyer points, quite often they chop them by a third or whatever, so make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, um, in terms of managing your relationship, as I mentioned earlier, you need to identify, you have, need to have very clear line responsibilities as to who is doing what on their, property, on their property projects. So one of you will do the suburb due diligence, one of you will actually be the project manager on site. So if you can do that, that line of um, demarcation in terms of who looks after what, it will be absolutely priceless. Um, you really do need separation on the workshop because I don't know any couple that has survived actually working together in the same area on the same thing? Okay, you're rare. 20 years? Oh my God. Um, so, well done. Got a good relationship. <laughs> and you still like each other? Absolutely. Oh, beautiful. All right, so, what's that? You give in a lot. That explains it. Okay. <laughs> See, I never gave in. All right, so, um, and reward yourselves at the end of the renovation as well. Like, you're obviously, you're going to be very busy during the physical construction time. Reward yourself, so treat yourself at the end, okay? Now, in terms of all of the, um, the mummies and daddies out there who are going to be managing children, um, I mean, um, the reality is I'm a mother and I do have, you know, a four-year-old. So, what I do is with my property business is I hire a nanny. My nan my, I make enough money in my property projects that I can hire my sister as um, my nanny. So my sister works for me Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. She gets to my house at um, 7 o'clock in the morning and she leaves at 5.30 in the afternoon. So if I'm on site from 7 till 3, um, that covers that period. My daughter goes to school Monday, Friday, so that I've got that covered. And so what it means is as a professional renovator, I can work normal core business hours and the profits obviously allow me to pay my sister. Now I have my sister down as a, an administration assistant of my business, on my property business. So all of those costs associated with her her nanny fees are tax deductible because I also get her to log my expenses. All the, when I pay a trade invoice or she pays the trade suppliers, she's doing that. So she's doing administration work as well while my daughter sleeps during the day. So again, if you set yourself right, right, these sort of things, you know, um, I'm not saying outsource your children, right? I'm like, don't get me wrong. Uh, I know I'm a de I said I'm a delegator, but you definitely don't delegate your children, all right? But what, what I'm saying is be smart about how you spend your time, where you spend your time. And so the, for that reason, um, <laughs> eBay? What I said? Okay. <laughs> so what you want to do is at least give you the capacity to focus on your property. So you, I can't stress it enough. You've got to focus. If you don't focus and get this business set up, you're not going to do anything. This, this course is going to be wasted money. 
Okay, that's the reality. So you need to put the, put the wheels in place to basically have this. Um, if you're a husband and wife and you don't want to leave, you don't, have, you don't have family members that you can help with children, then tag team it. So maybe the hubby's on site in the morning and then at lunchtime you do the crossover and the, the wife goes on site at afternoon. Trade hours are 7 till 3. So, you know, somebody does 7 till 11. The other one does 11 till 4. There's so many ways you can make this work. It's incredible. Um, you know, if you, can't, if you haven't got a family member, get somebody from the daycare centre. There's plenty of mums, working mums out there who have got children and they, they struggle to find a part-time school hours job. There's so many ways you can do this. Um, don't work weekends. That is your family time. I have a rule that I never work on my renovation projects on the Saturday because you do need time out from your renovation projects. And if you don't manage the time factor, it will consume your life. You will be at Bunnings at 11 o'clock on you know, 9, 8.45 before it shuts at 9 on a Wednesday night if you don't control it. When you have a rule that you don't work weekends and all the tradies will want to work on weekends, you say, no, on my sites, I don't work weekends. The site is shut. So when you, when you say no to that, what it does, it makes you become more productive Monday to Friday, okay? So you have to definitely have a balance, definitely have a balance because it can consume your life if you don't manage this. All right, any questions on Saturday? So that's a basic thing, like not hard. A lot of, some of you may have found that really general, particularly the property and um, property um, business owners at the moment, but there's still a lot of people that haven't even gone through that process. So very simple. So it's just about getting your corporate identity, all the little bits and pieces to establish yourself so people can start to take you seriously. Any questions on that section before we move into the company and tax? Okay, great.